Yes, yes. All right, we are back yet again on the Hoplite channel. I am your host, Hop, and you are here because you clicked on the title, Samurai Literature, Taira Shigesuge, Part 2. So, uh, yeah, we're picking up here with Part 2 uh, for Shigesuke. Uh, for those of you who uh, have uh, come here after seeing Part 1, welcome back. Glad you're here. For those who haven't seen it, um, I recommend you go back and give a part one a watch. Uh, but if you decide to watch this one, it probably won't do any harm since uh, the work we're going to be going into, the Bushido Shoshinshu, uh, can be read uh, out of sequence. So uh, in any event, um, I left off the second, I'm sorry, I left off the first segment saying that for the second segment, we would get uh, into uh, perhaps some more detail about Shigesuke himself. However, I decided to leave that for the third segment and talk a little bit more about the era in which Shigesuke lived and the era in which his work, the Budo Shoshinshu, uh, was written. So uh, a little historical frame of reference uh, is in order. And we begin with the head honcho, Tokugawa Ieyasu. So if you go back and watch um, some of my segments on the uh, Bushido primer series, as well as, um, actually more importantly, the uh, series on Yagyu Munanori, we know that uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu um, consolidated uh, Japan into one feudal system under his shogunate. And it happened after the 1600 Battle of Sekigahara. And there's actually a couple of very good videos on YouTube uh, about the Battle of Sekigahara. Uh, if you want some uh, deeper dive into uh, Japanese feudal history, uh, I recommend you check those out. Kings and Generals, I think, does a really good one. Anyway, when Ieyasu uh, was victorious uh, at the Battle of Sekigahara, he formed the third tent government, and this was in 1603. So give or take two to three years after Sekigahara. And uh, what did he do? Well, he moved the seat of government to Edo, which is today modern-day Tokyo. So you could say the Tokugawa shogunate had a very uh, profound impact on Japan uh, beyond the feudal age because Tokyo is, you know, its capital, still its most popular city. And um, because of Ieyasu, uh, Edo, Tokyo became what it is today. That's where it got to start. Uh, and he instituted uh, several policies. And one policy in particular was the uh, Sokoku. And Sokoku just meant national isolation. Uh, he was going to let Japan look after Japan. Japan was going to run its own affairs internally. They were not going to seek conquest outside of Japan and China or Korea. And they were not going to permit many outsiders to influence uh, Japan uh, either. So uh, this created a period known as, well, I, maybe it's in some circles, but I call it the Pax Tokugawa. And if you're familiar with uh, Roman history, you know that Octavian, the nephew of Julius Caesar, took over uh, from his, uh, after his uncle's death, uh, assassination rather, and uh, formed the second triumvirate. And after uh, some time, he got sick of Marcus Lepidus and uh, Mark Antony and consolidated power uh, in his own, uh, in his own, under his own rule. And he was the beginning of the Julio-Claudio uh, Claudio dynasty. And the Julio-Claudian dynasty, uh, with Octavian becoming Caesar Augustus, uh, issued forth a period of relative peace. Although there were some skirmishes in uh, Germania, which would plague the, uh, the Julio-Claudian dynasty, um, Rome overall saw a, an incredible expansion in technology, in the arts, in laws, uh, and, and in just overall uh, infrastructure. And the Pax Romana, the 200 years that, that uh, Caesar Augustus instituted that carried forth after his death, uh, was considered a golden age um, in uh, Roman history. So too uh, was uh, Tokugawa's, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu's third tent government in the beginning of his Pax Tokugawa. This was a bit of a golden age for Japan as well. And we see that it lasted from around 1639 to 1854 AD. So a good bit of years. And this was a period of change. However, um, 
a lot of things that took place uh, really allowed Japan to come into its own. And because of its isolation uh, during this period, uh, the culture of Japan flourished um, in and of itself. And we see that in this, for the samurai in particular, many things changed and that they were moved from the countryside that were when they lived on the, the land of their feudal lords, the, the daimyo. Uh, Yesu uh, decreed that the policy would be for samurai to move from the countryside into castles in the individual precincts. So sort of like a barrack system. He's like, well, why did he do this? Well, he was probably concerned that maybe these samurai living out in the countryside, uh, that if they were um, of the mind to form rebellions, and particular, in particular some daimyos uh, that maybe didn't agree with the uh, Tokugawa shogunate could uh, join forces outside of the uh, shogun's uh, purview, this would be a threat. So he figured, all right, move the samurai from the countryside into these castles. That way we can better uh, monitor them and organize samurai uh, for the shogun's benefit. This is most likely what happened. But other things were a consequence uh, of this, this move as well. And it was a time of peace, so this allowed samurai to pursue, pursue academics and even sciences. You had some uh, samurai that practiced medicine, actually became physicians, uh, and, and bushi. So you had a, a warrior physician, like a, like a corpsman. Uh, it was, that was very interesting that they, uh, they pursued other avenues of uh, arts and sciences and um, disciplines. But uh, we also see persecution. And during uh, the uh, Tokugawa shogunate, Christianity was officially outlawed in Japan in 1636. And you also had Buddhists and Confucianism uh, limited as well. Now we know that Taka and Soho was a Zen Buddhist. And we know that Yagyu Munanori uh, eventually came to practice it in, uh, in his own time, and as well as uh, uh, Yamamoto Sunetomo, uh, when he uh, left his uh, life as a samurai, he took upon the name uh, Yamamoto, Yamamoto Jocho and became a Zen Buddhist monk as well. So Zen Buddhism was permitted, uh, as was Confucianism, but it, it became uh, frowned, not frowned upon, I would say, but uh, it maybe ro arose some sort of suspicion in certain circles because Buddhism and Confucianism was a Chinese religion brought to Japan. And like Christianity, being a Western uh, a religion, um, it was looked upon unfavorably. Christianity uh, definitely was because it was considered a very foreign um, philosophy being brought to the Japanese uh, kingdom. However, uh, Confucianism and Buddhism, with China being so close and so much pre-existing history, it was permitted in limited respects. But as I said, uh, because of all these changes under the Tokugawa Shogunate and the Pax Tokugawa, you had the golden age of samurai literature. And between these uh, years, you see books like The Life-Giving Sword, The Demon Sermon, The Book of the Five Rings, The Hagakure, and of course, the Budo Shoshinshu, which we're going to read from here in a moment. Um, these, these books, these writings... Uh, became possible, I believe, because of this golden age of the samurai it, in, the, in the respect that perhaps there was not warfare and perhaps the, the bushi was um, not, you could say, he was not serving in the role he was designed for, to be a warrior who was constantly moving from battle to battle or from campaign to campaign. But it gave uh, the, the samurai who were alive in this period uh, more time to reflect on Bushido and give their thoughts uh, for posterity for the Bushi that would come after them um, to take with them uh, if uh, the uh, prospect of war or conquest or invasion uh, became everyday life again. But we know by 1854 the samurai, although not extinct, were definitely um, on their way to being a... Um, a relic of the past. And by, by the 1880s, you can say that there probably were not even a handful of samurai left around. But um, as I said, uh, this was the golden age of samurai literature. And we will read some more from the Budo Shushinshu. And I will provide the read along uh, as I always do. And we'll talk about the passages. Okay. And we jump right in. Wasting no time. Going to page 18. 
and Shigesuke wrote, Whenever you meet able and experienced officers present at a gathering, leave off useless conversation and inquire into such things that occur to you as might be useful tips for the future. Question repeatedly, listen carefully, and remember everything. Borrow old manuals of procedure and protocol, even illustrations, and make copies of these for future reference. Okay, yeah. This, uh, this is, again, his advice to uh, younger samurai who are not serving uh, their lords in times of war. Uh, they are not on the, on the front lines. They're not uh, away from home, away from family, away from their dojos, away from any places of learning. So if they have this time to read and to listen, they should take full advantage of it. And they should listen to the experienced officers who perhaps have served, have served on the front lines or who have served in a war or conflict because that is, that is the, uh, the teacher who carries that experience around with him and that, that lesson you can learn from listening uh, to that samurai speak of his experience is invaluable because you're not just talking about something theoretically. You're not just speaking about warfare or techniques on the battlefield or a strategy in a scholarly sense. You're talking to someone who has done it in the real world. And you could always say that the best teachers are those who have actually taken the discipline of what they have studied and put it into actual practice. Uh, some of the best teachers you will see uh, in colleges or universities are those who have left the college that they uh, were students at, went into the real world, perhaps in business or in science, or in the military or something of that nature, and then they returned and became professors and teachers. So you could say that I've learned X, Y, and Z while I was at school, and I learned A, B, and C while I was in the real world. Let me tell you what is true and let me tell you what is false. Those kind of lessons you, you, you really can't put a price on. And uh, Shigesuke was telling the younger samurai to take notes, uh, copious notes, ask questions, uh, because these opportunities to learn from those with the experience, sometimes th these opportunities don't come around very often. Yeah. Okay. Next passage. We move to page 22. And Shigesuke wrote, The process of cultivating the practice of doing right begins with fear of being disrespected by those close to you, starting with your family and servants then advances to refraining from doing wrong and deliberately doing right for fear of incurring the same shame of being censured and ridiculed by society at large. So when it comes to doing right and being courageous, there is nothing to go on but a sense of shame. If you do wrong, unconcerned that people will say it is wrong, or if you are cowardly without caring what people will laugh at you for spinelessness, there is nothing anyone can teach you. Okay. So, yeah, this... Um, this is very uh, Eastern. This is, this is uh, very Japanese uh, in the sense that shame is one of those primary uh, motivating factors when it comes to uh, Eastern philosophy, when it comes to Shintoism or Bushido. Uh, the samurai um, being uh, a member of the uh, uh, Japanese culture uh, understands this um, without further explanation. To be shamed because of cowardice or, because, or be shamed because you do something wrong and society looks down upon you. This is something that um, no samurai wanted to live with. And we understand that uh, seppuku, the ritual uh, suicide of a samurai, was seen as one of the last acts you could perform in an attempt perhaps to absolve yourself of shame. Uh, that if you have done something or failed to do something, uh, and that, that failure or that action was so egregious that there is no point in living life any further with this shame ho uh, hovering over your head. It is best just to open your belly and have someone chop your head off because that's the best you could hope for as far as winning back any sense of honor or pride. So what he's saying here is that for the samurai, to be courageous, you must carry with you this... Um, acute sense of what is shameful and what is honorable, what is righteous and what is wicked. Um, the, the beginnings of shame 
start small. But if you let them metastasize and society comes to look upon you as a shameful person, this is a rock sometimes you will never be able to get out from under. So don't find yourself in that place to begin with. Carry courage in your heart and always maintain a sense of pride and honor in what you do, hoping that it will bring you pride and honor and that shame was to always be avoided. Yeah. Okay. Page 40 is the next passage. Shigesuke wrote, To be an opportunist and a fair-weather friend, honoring the unworthy when you see them thriving and despising the worthy when you see them in decline is the mentality of peasants and merchants. It is not right for a warrior. All right. So again, he's using the, uh, maybe not a shame tactic, but he's speaking to the young samurai who says that to praise people who are dishonorable is it's, uh, in itself dishonorable. And to not lend a helping hand or perhaps aid a person who is honorable but suffering or perhaps going through some difficulty is also dishonorable. So you must know the difference between honor and dishonor, between uh, righteousness and, and, and wickedness, between good and evil. And you must never confuse the two by seeing someone doing well or thriving who is dishonorable and looking at that person as someone to emulate. Just the same as you should never look at someone who is doing the honorable thing but suffering on account of it and seeing that person as someone to avoid or someone to uh, leave, to their, leave to their own devices because what they're going through looks painful or perhaps even uh, counterproductive. Uh, if what they're doing is honorable, you, you, need, you shouldn't be a fair-weather friend to that person um, because, and you can probably, in your own life, remember the times when you regarded someone as a close friend and they weren't there for you when you needed them to be. And then when you were doing well and thriving and uh, riding high, all of a sudden this same person would show up and wonder if there was anything uh, they could help you with or maybe um, you could uh, uh, see to it that uh, maybe they could benefit from your success as well. Yeah, it's interesting how that happens where you're down in your luck and it's crickets and it's a ghost town. But then when you're uh, king of the hill, everybody wants uh, your ear for a second they want to give you a pat on the back and, and to shake your hand. This is how life works. But to be honorable and, and a samurai uh, who values the virtue of honor, don't be a fair weather friend. Don't praise the dishonorable and don't shun the honorable. Okay. Next passage. Page 48. And this will be our last reading. This is a chapter titled Warriors. Shigesuke said, Warriors are functionaries who are supposed to punish criminals disrupting society and bring security to the members of the other three classes. Therefore, if you are of low rank, as a warrior, you should not abuse or mistreat the other three classes. For a warrior whose duty it is to restrain brigandry, it will not do to act like a brigand yourself. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this, this is a good lesson, and this is, this is applicable to uh, any society, any race, culture, creed. If you are a warrior in your respective country, uh, for your respective culture, in any time period, um, you are entrusted to be the administer of justice. You are the administration of a government and you are the enforcement arm. So if you believe in your country, if you believe in your people, and if you believe in the laws that govern what is good uh, and what is righteous, then you yourself must be a, a, a fine steward of that righteousness, of that law. If you seek to punish criminals, you must see to it you do not become a criminal yourself. If you wish to set an example uh, to lower samurai, below you, you must extol the virtues of Bushido and show them that this is the correct path and you must not fall into brigandry because if you are here to punish the brigands, why are you yourself allowing, your, allow, allowing you and your fellow samurai to act as brigands? 
And this is the same as say like, well, you know, they say uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I think Shigesuke knew this as a samurai, even in the lower classes, because you were part of the nobility, it was tempting to steal because if you are the uh, administer of justice, who's going to come around and tell you you can't? Uh, if you wanted to do something dishonorable and someone uh, perhaps called you out on it, well, you could slash at them with your sword if they were the lower class. If a peasant or a serf got in your way, you could hack at him or uh, harass him because he's beneath you. But this is the power that corrupts. If you are given this task by your culture, by your emperor, by your shogun, you must treat it as though it is sacrosanct. It must not be violated. Because once you break the public trust and they see you as a member of the nobility class who acts no differently than a criminal, they will lose faith in their culture. They will lose faith in the law. And they will lose faith in the order of a society they once respected. And this is the greater good that must be maintained. And the warrior class falling into this corruption where you have dirty cops and you have uh, dishonorable samurai, that is a culture that is probably circling the drain. And the samurai knew this was something that could not be tolerated uh, among their own ranks. And uh, it's one of the reasons, actually, I respect the samurai culture and the uh, art of Bushido, the philosophy of it, because uh, it was honor above all, it was righteousness. And despite the fact that there are plenty of samurai who probably fell short of these virtues, uh, these virtues maintained throughout the Tokugawa shogunate and beyond and prior to, and uh, they are definitely good models for, uh, I guess you would say, behavior for a warrior to um, meditate on every day and look on as a set of principles that he should always measure himself against. Because despite the fact that you may fail or your fellow samurai may fail, your warriors may slip in the way, you can always refresh yourself with these virtues and remind yourself, uh, as well as your fellow samurai, what you're here for and why it's so important. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. So we uh, conclude here uh, part two of Shigesuke. Uh, I will move to part three and we will cover... Like I said in part one, uh, more of the personal life of Shigesuke. Uh, despite the fact that there's not a whole lot of uh, historical record for this man, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can um, do a little more research and dig something up. But again, we will read from the Code of the Samurai, the Budo Shushinshu. And then uh, once we are done with part three of Shigesuke, we will move on to part one of Miyamoto Musashi. And I hope you stick around for that one too. But uh, as I always say, I uh, appreciate you being here. Um, you know, obviously, if it's just me talking into a camera, uh, who cares? But uh, I hope you are enjoying uh, Samurai Lit series. Uh, if you're liking that, uh, give it a thumb up. And if you are liking the channel, you subscribers, uh, share it around. If you think there's others out there who find it uh, interesting, uh, this period, uh, this, this subject matter, Samurai Literature. And uh, we will see you for the next one in part three. Till then, take care.